Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more Overly Sarcastic Productions, and this time we have a new trope talk to watch, and it's environmental storytelling. Now this is obviously a bit of storytelling that is a whole lot easier to do in a visual medium, um, because obviously when you are writing, when you are doing it in a novel, you have to, right, you have, you don't necessarily have the pages to devote to uh environment like it's it's harder to weave that into the uh storytelling without it being like like uh it takes it takes a lot of work to have it be there so that it's not um distracting or pulling away from any sort of momentum or anything like that um and so it, it tends to also not be as uh noticeable of a thing but it's also often used as a means of foreshadowing uh, and often I feel like when it comes to novel writing, when it comes to the, using the environment um, as a background thing to further enhance your story and things like that, it tends to also be uh, more uh, tied to the themes of the story that you are wanting to tell. Um, whereas in a TV show or a movie, you can have things in the background to showcase all of that, the themes and the like, but also you can use it to subtly um, show uh, deeper world building without really devoting any sort of uh, extra time to it, right? Like, we can we can do a shot of characters go walking in a city, um, and then we can have things happening in the background um, that tell us so much about life in the city without really any without it being distracting without any uh, effort being done that's a whole lot harder um uh to do in a novel because again it's especially if you're telling most stories um are done through you know pov that means you're like it's going to be things that your character is the person you are experiencing the story through their mind that's stuff that they are noticing, right? So it, it, it's more like in your face and it's taking up more space, you know? Um, so it's not, uh, it's just a bit, uh, it's harder to, it's just harder to, to get it uh, um, across, I'd say, as effectively as, as you can just do it with, uh, uh, like this is one of those tropes and forms of storytelling that uh, visual mediums have an, a massive advantage over when it comes to uh, written storytelling. Uh -huh. I figured out the right words to say there at the end. <laughs> Let's dive in. There's this thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, so it'll probably show up in more videos as I try to untangle it to my personal satisfaction. It started when I was unpacking the concept of the noodle incident. As discussed, that's basically a trope where the entire impact of the bit is rooted in the fact that whatever the noodle incident was, it happened off screen and the audience doesn't get to see it. And that sort of made me realize how much of effective storytelling can be hidden in things that happen off screen. If you've interacted with any fandom spaces online, you're probably very familiar with this fanish impulse to speculate about what happened when the camera was off. What was the noodle incident? What happened between these episodes? What happened during this time skip? What was the subject of this off-screen conversation? Missing Scene is an entire genre of fanfiction centered on that premise. Take a slice of the story timeline you didn't get to see, unpack what's inside. Fun fact, uh, my first exposure to this was there was a, a She-Ra fanfiction that it turned out had been written by N.D. Stevenson, the person who made She-Ra in the first place, and it was a Missing Scene fanfic between some episodes has not actually been confirmed by N.D. Stevenson to be his fan, but it's the one the fans last So it's in season five, basically uh, after Save the Cat and before the episode right after Save the Cat, it was a missing scene fic of like what happened between those episodes. And there were comments from people before it turned out that it was N.D. Stevenson who were like, oh my gosh, you have such a good grasp of these characters. Like this really feels like it could have been just part of the show originally. <laughs> Turns out there's a reason for that. Now I'm a card carrying over thing. 
Exploring the emotional ramifications of high stakes. And I love this kind of stuff. But I guess the thing I've noticed is that this impulse to fill in the gaps of the story is one of the widest gulfs between how fans and creators think. Because indulging the missing scene instinct is an incredibly fun way to engage with a story that already exists. But if a writer is writing an original story from the fanish perspective that all off-screen gaps of time exist to be unpacked and shown in full, they're potentially kneecapping their ability to leverage any of the tropes that actually rely on keeping things out of the audience's sight. Obviously, some story is going to happen off screen just because of genre conventions and the real time cost of creating art in the first place. Sometimes stuff happens off screen because it's boring or repetitive or completely unnecessary. We don't keep the camera glued to the characters 24-7, and part of that is because the story that produced would be tedious and poorly paced. No offense yep. to real life. But the fact that there are off screen time gaps in a story isn't just a necessity of the creative process or a problem to be solved through fan speculation. Untouched chunks of story time aren't always benefited by being cracked open and mined out and shown clearly for the benefit of the audience. Sometimes keeping things off screen is intentional. Sometimes it's more effective than just showing the audience the whole thing front to back. And one of the most blatant examples of those tropes is encapsulated under the broad umbrella of environmental storytelling. Now, oh, environmental storytelling broad? is a term almost exclusively used in game design, although the concept didn't originate there and is definitely not exclusive to it. When it was coined by former Disney Imagineer Don Carson back in 2000, he was talking about how he designed theme park attractions to imply a story around the audience and participants to give them stories infused into the physical space that they could explore and interact with, and to make an environment that was more than just a building the guests were passing through. Carson was writing in the early days of video game development and was basically of the opinion that we could be doing a lot better than the slim pickings of the year 2000, and he hmm. was objectively correct. Yep. Environmental storytelling has become the byword of visual game development, centered on the idea that games are more engaging when they feel like more than just a neutral environment for the player to use the game mechanics in. Now, this trope was codified in the context of interactive stories, also known as stories that don't don't have main characters independently playing out the plot for the benefit of an outside audience with a move I definitely I think I definitely have a much more um narrow um definition of what I consider to be environmental storytelling like some of the things especially the examples she pulled I just consider those to be like that's I don't know how to word it Red's movie right. <laughs> or TV show or book, the audience sees the characters interacting with the world in a specific pre-plotted way, which means the audience sees the world through the actions of the characters. With a game or interactive theme park attraction, the audience is put into the fictional situation and invited to do what they want. They don't have the benefit of a writer guiding their POV character through all the highlights and best bits. It's up to them to pick their way through the story in a fun and engaging way, and that means it's up to the designer to guide them through their environment in such a way that the story they play out is engaging. This is the goal of environmental story storytelling, to lay out the situation in such a way that the player is drawn to explore it. And the main way this is done is to drop the player into an unclear scenario where something has already happened off screen. They're basically in a crime scene. Something went down. Find the evidence okay. of what happened so you I can piece together the timeline. Are there bloodstains? Scrawled messages on the walls? Skeletons posed in comedic arrangements? Did somebody leave their entire journal lying around? Maybe 28 fully voiced audio logs? In the broadest possible terms, environmental storytelling is the idea that a setting is more interesting if it feels like... I love the audio logs in uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't know if I've talked about this, but I love Horizon Zero Dawn. I'm kind of meh on Horizon Forbidden West. I feel like um, a lot of the mystery of Zero Dawn, a lot of the mystery that Zero Dawn had, and it, it just... <sighs> Forbidden West fell into some tropey... I don't want to say trope, like... Obviously, because like, if a trope is done well, then it doesn't feel like a trope, right? Um, I'm sure y'all have heard that saying before. Um, so, it, 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 like, there was a character death that I just did not like, because it was, like, it just it was so obvious, and it just felt kind of really cheap. I did not like the villains, the, the antagonists of, of Forbidden West. It felt too out there, right? Like, where they came from was hinted at a bit in Zero Dawn, but I just, what they actually were, um, was kind of whack to me. I don't know. I didn't really care for where they took it. Um, and, and we didn't get to do, I didn't really feel like I learned more about the world and also the fall of civilization from before. Obviously we got a good idea as to the fall of civilization in Zero Dawn, but like, I don't know, there was just, there was stuff to, there was a bunch of stuff to explore 
but I ultimately, and we're, we're talking about this through the video game perspective, I ultimately did not feel rewarded, really, for exploring all these places. Like, I, um, did I get the 100% in that game? I think I did. I can't remember. Um, uh, but I fully explored the map. I did, I did all of the side shit. And ultimately, I just kind of felt meh about it. Um, whereas, you know, the environmental storytelling of Elder Scrolls, of, of Bethesda games, tend to be top tier. They tend to be very, very good at designing their worlds to make you want to explore them. Fallout 4, uh, uh, Skyrim, right? You want to get lost and wander. That's like the point of them. Um, I'm trying to think of other good, ex really good examples. Um, Red Dead 2, I think, is pretty good with it, too. Um, with you just wanting to wander and see, see the environment. Um, but more, I don't know if that necessarily comes from the storytelling of the environment and just more so, like, the, the aesthetic, the vibes of the exploration. So, I, I, like, again, it, it depends on how how broad we take the, the the term of environmental storytelling i wouldn't necessarily call the appeal of red dead 2 as i mean it, it does have a really good open world which i guess it does apply to environmental storytelling but I don't, what draws me obviously this comes into percept my uh personal uh enjoyment uh what i find really enjoyable about red dead 2 isn't really any of the story stuff it's more so just the vibes <laughs> it's it's more so like um not the story being told in the world, but just the the aesthetic of it. Like, it's very calming to be in that game and just exploring nature and just doing, like, hunting and stuff like that. I don't know. It's very, it's very like, relax and just ride my horse, take it for a little canter, uh, uh, a little gallop, perhaps a walk, and just see the world. Um... I think God of War also, God of War 2018, I think, had much better environmental storytelling than Ragnarok. Um, anyways, let, things back to happened Red there talk. before the story timeline got to it, and those things shaped the way the world looks and feels. And invisibly critical to this idea is the fact that those things that happened didn't get. I, f I figured out how I want to, where, how I'm looking at environmental storytelling. I'm looking at it really solely from the perspective of it. It says environmental storytelling is stuff in the periphery that isn't tied to what the characters are experiencing necessarily obviously in my opinion um in my opinion the best stories the best writers are going to have those periphery environmental storytelling beats be somehow linked and tied to the overall themes and the overall wider story being told within the however whatever medium you are experiencing the story through uh right it, it every thing inside of the story serves a purpose to the overall story um but i, I don't know part of me feels like red is tying it more so to uh is tying it more in, like making it more like something you are actively aware of. And I don't think that's, that's not necessarily how I view environmental storytelling, but obviously like, again, right. This is where we get, I'm not, <sighs> when it, my, for some reason, my brain does not handle, you know, um, writing, things like bro like broadly like i do not do good with these kinds of def like there are certain things that uh i feel work really good with broad definitions but when it comes to like i guess the creative process the the uh this kind of stuff i mean because we see this in like probably every you know, this is like probably every single trope talk episode where i'm like i have the more narrow vision of what the trope is then I have the more narrow definition of it, but Red comes in with the broader 
perspective. She sees things more uh, broadly than I do. My brain cannot think, does not care, or, uh, doesn't really like uh, these things being that broad. You know, like, I don't know how to explain what's going on up here. <laughs> shown instead of seeing what went down and then the scars it left on the landscape and then seeing the characters putting those events together we see the scars on the landscape first and either the characters unravel okay. some of the events that went down through the sparse evidence left behind or the audience is just left to take it in at their own pace and come to their own conclusions okay no we do have okay ryan let red talk more and then you would realize you are having the same perspective on things I, I forget to do that every time I watch a trope talk. There are small scale examples of this trope that give us an easy inroad to picking apart the larger scale concept. Most obviously, unraveling the environmental storytelling of a scene is the entire central mechanism behind a detective. God, I still need to watch Batman. Detective figuring out what went down in a crime scene. They're presented with a situation where a crime was committed. Usually there's a body lying around and some evidence of the struggle or whatever. And the detective takes in the scene and methodically unpacks the timeline of events that must have gone down. In this case, the fact that the crime wasn't shown to the audience in any detail is central to the mystery element, where we're along for the ride as the detective pieces it together and narrows down the suspect list. This is part of why a lot of detective stories are seen to be more effective if they give the audience enough clues that they could actually put it together on their own, because that's how you engage with storytelling that happened off screen, by figuring it out. If instead you're presented with an unsolvable situation and then the detective tells you what happened off screen, the audience isn't engaging with it in a way that off screen storytelling is designed to be engaged with. But there's a secondary element that this off screenness lets the audience experience dawning horror. In general, seeing something horrifying is, you know, unpleasant, but it's not as unpleasant as slowly figuring out something horrifying. Yep. Seeing the horror movie monster slavering at the camera isn't as horrifying as the slow dawning realization that it's in the room with you. Seeing a violent crime occur isn't as horrifying as slowly uncovering the extent and consequences of the violence. And I think we've hit something here that helps us get a grip on identifying when a story element is more effective when kept off screen. We're probably all familiar with the adage about horror movies being scarier when the monster isn't shown, and I think that fits into this space here. If the writer's goal is to give the audience information about what went down, the most effective way to do that is to just show them the events playing out in detail on screen. But if the writer's goal is to make the audience feel horror specifically, the most effective way to do that is to keep clear access to that information from them. When environmental storytelling is used for horror, the original events that went down to shape the environment are almost never shown directly. Instead, the characters will slowly piece together the information they can glean from their surroundings and gradually realize how much trouble they're now, admittedly, if the audience is given more information than the characters, that can be used for a soupçon of dramatic irony that elevates the horror of seeing the characters in more peril than they realize they're in, but in horror settings that's usually kept to the relatively small beats of the camera lets the audience get a hint of the monster before the character realizes it's in the room with them, and doesn't go as far as demystifying the entire scenario. The audience only needs to know enough to be afraid. This is the space where you find most late to the tragedy environmental storytelling, where the characters arrive in a location they're expecting to be broadly inoffensive, only to usually experience an escalation from, huh, it's a lot quieter than I expected, to, yep. oh, there's a lot more bodies lying around than <laughs> I expected, to, oh, good, one of them left a diary documenting yeah. their final moments, to, good news, whatever made all these people into corpses has come back for seconds. These stories benefit tremendously by keeping the audience's perspective firmly glued to the characters exploring the space as they figure out what went down and experience the dawning horror of realizing how much trouble they're in. And this is where we can start picking apart some of the general environmental cues that get used in environmental storytelling to signal specific specifically that something is very wrong. This is a pretty easy thing to signal to an audience as long as they have expectations for what the setting should be like if it's functioning correctly. And that obviously varies from setting to setting and can be very different depending on location and genre conventions and stuff like that. The expectations going into a dwarven mine are a little bit different than what you'd hmm. expect to see going into a high-tech space station or an arctic research base, but there are a few simple elements that show up almost every time. Lighting is a very common one. Most people navigate by sight and do not like operating in dim slash dark conditions. So, a location being completely dark signals, something knocked out the lights and the problem is currently unfixable. There's nobody left to fix it. There's a really good reason to keep all the lights off. The majority of people, fictional or otherwise, navigate primarily by sight, which means well-maintained environments are usually kept well lit. If our heroes rock up to a key location and find all the lights blown out or dimly flickering, that indicates that something is wrong because under normal circumstances that would be a high priority to fix. If it's still not working, that either means the lights are super extra broken or there's nobody around to fix it. There's also ways you can slip in more specific environmental storytelling here. Maybe all the lights are burned out, but there's a surplus of candles around, which indicates that yes, the lights burned out, but there 
there are people here who have been able to adapt to that situation using candles. This is one of the ways that a background setting, even with no characters in it, can communicate information to the audience about what probably happened off screen. In the same vein, cleanliness is it takes effort and upkeep to keep a place clean, and regular use will also reduce dust buildup in frequented areas. Certain kinds of mess are also a high priority to clean, like blood and bodies, so their presence indicates there's nobody left to keep it clean. Anyone still here has different priorities. Yes. It's an easy cue to signal how well an area has been maintained, and therefore to imply something about the con- Okay. I was wrong. Red and I do have a very much similar understanding, and- like belief in what environment environmental storytelling entails um she definitely is going more into it about uh the horror kind of element of it the suspense sort of uh form of environmental storytelling at least right now we still have you know over 10 minutes <laughs> to watch um obviously my experience with environmental storytelling is more so tied to uh like the world building uh, uh of of a uh, of it right um just because of the genre that i write in like yes of course you still use this for uh suspense building and stuff like that in certain situations but more so in fantasy it is very much sort of a way in to do uh world building is typically how it's more so used a means of getting the world building in without um you know info dumping without just dialogue dump and exposition condition of the people maintaining it not all messes are created equal clutter in a well-lived-in workshop doesn't necessarily signal that anything is wrong but things like an inch of dust on a main thoroughfare or an absolute butt ton of cobwebs or assorted bloodstains and body parts signals pretty strongly that something happened to all the people who would normally be expected to be navigating this space pretty regularly and therefore have a vested interest in cleaning it up and again this can be used to communicate more than just that for instance in castlevania one of the ways that they communicate how emotionally broken the survivors of Wallachia are is that they aren't cleaning up all these corpses and dead bodies that keep piling up day after day even though that is something that would be an incredibly high priority to clean for anybody who's like in man I need to watch Castlevania <laughs> in a decent place mentally. Specific environments can also have specific cues that something has gone wrong. If a setting is in space, which is one of the most popular environments for something really bad happened here stories, there's a ton of life support expectations that can be used to signal that everything has gone to shit. Shipwide temperature regulations not working, air supply running out or contaminated, things that would be very high priority problems for a normally operating spaceship, but were evidently unable to be fixed. This passively communicates information with the audience that the people who would be able to fix it either can't or won't for whatever reason. But the thing is, environmental storytelling is about the entire space of communicating information through environment design. It's not all about how things have gone horribly wrong. That's just one of the easier contexts to notice environmental storytelling. Okay, now we're gonna, she was talking about through how it can service um, those kind of beats. Like now we're probably gonna get into, she's gonna probably talk about it with world building. happening because it's heightened from the norm and its narrative effectiveness is bound up in only showing the audience what happened through context clues to make them experience a feeling of horror. But environmental storytelling is one of those elements of storytelling that kind of permeates all the way down. It's everywhere, setting the vibes and the tone and the energy of the room. When the story is going normally, we expect there to be a certain amount of narrative noise, dialogue and monologue and narration and characters broadly taking center stage in one way or another. But when all the characters quiet down, or more accurately, are dead, they stop drowning out the background noise that is the environment itself. This part of storytelling is by far the easiest to notice when the environment is otherwise dead and deserted. But the background of a scene is always communicating information about the world and the setting and the past events that have shaped it, even when there's layers of noise and characterization stacked on top of it. Every element of background and setting design communicates something about the world it's set in, and you can really tell when a story is being put together by people who think about that a lot. And it might be pretty clear from the way I've talked about it up to this point, but until quite recently, I did not think about this very much. I've clearly always hmm. enjoyed it. I found it effective. The Minds of Moria were a formative experience for me, and I knew that I liked the specific sort of dawning horror energy that happens when characters explore a place where something awful happened and they don't know what. But while this was an element of storytelling that I always found effective, I never really paid it much attention on its own. The background of the shot was never where I was looking, so it just sort of washed over me as a general vibe without really catching my focus. And I That means you were engaging with good storytelling, because if it's stuff that you're not necessarily like actively paying attention to, then that's good. I consider that to be really good environmental storytelling. That means it is doing what it's kind of meant to do. It's, in my opinion, not something that's meant to be actively um, 
thought about while you are necessarily reading the story. It's there to like kind of tickle your subconscious, I think is the best way to put it. Um, that at least that's how I uh, kind of look at it. And then like, you know what? I'll, I'll compare it to Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson, I think, is pretty good at doing this kind of subtle background uh, environment, environmental uh, storytelling in his stories, especially with uh, Mistborn. Mistborn had things happening that you were getting bits of here and there, but you're not necessarily like you. You read it and you're kind of you might think of it in, in one way because of the context of the events as they are happening. But then later down in the story, especially book one, um, you start to then like you're kind of reading it and you're kind of you, you, you're looking at it from one perspective. And in a way, it's in the back. It's lingering in the back of your mind, but you're not actively truly thinking about it. At least I wasn't while you're reading it until a certain point in the story when then uh, something clicks and you're like, wait a goddamn minute. And then you start thinking about all that environmental storytelling that led you to this point. And, and so then, like, like, so that's how I think of it. It's subconscious. It's a, it should be subconscious um, up until a certain point within the story. And, of course, this ties into, you know, the theme and exactly what kind of story you want to tell. Um, it fits really well for Mistborn as one example. But, like, right, like, you get to a certain point. Uh, and so, like, you know, whether it be, like, the the twist or the big, the climactic moment, everything was building this, then those environmental stories no longer are in the subconscious, um, but now they're at the forefront of your mind because they're like, wow, it was there all along, right? That sort of... Does that make sense? <laughs> and I think that's because when a background element is doing its job, it isn't the center of attention. Yep, Brandon and I agree. <laughs> it elevates and contextualizes the characters that are navigating it, and it quietly teaches the audience how the world feels and functions without needing to explicitly spell it out through exposition. And some stories pay a lot more attention to this than others. For instance, most Ghibli movies pay a ludicrous amount of attention to environment design, and some yep. of my favorites are broadly about specific environments and the way they work, and how they communicate to the audience the forces that shaped them in the off-screen backstory. The setting of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is irrevocably shaped by the Seven Days of Fire, an ancient war that burned the old world down and poisoned the earth itself. Characters speak casually of the acid lake near the valley, or the ancient wrecked warship beached on the shore. A flyby over the wasteland reveals strange mountains that are clearly the melted remains of ancient skyscrapers. The idyllic farming community in the Valley of the Wind is only protected from the deadly environment around them by the wind off the sea, keeping away the miasma and the fungal spores of the Sea of Decay, a deadly forest of toxic fungus and giant bugs which has a constant presence hanging over everything. As an undercurrent of the story, Naushika studies the Sea of Decay to understand its function, and she realizes that the toxins in the Sea of Decay aren't innate to the plants, but are being drawn up from the water and Earth itself. The Earth was poisoned by the actions of humans, and the Sea of Decay exists to cleanse it and make it livable again. The Earth isn't the enemy, it's just that the process of healing itself is difficult for the humans who poisoned it in the first place to survive. The world of Naushika is a post-apocalyptic horror show, but every horrifying element like acid lakes and melted skyscrapers is the direct consequence of human action. The Sea of Decay looks like a nightmarish ecological apocalypse that needs to be beaten back with fire and steel lest it overrun their cities and drive them to extinction, which is what the antagonists of the movie want to do to it. But since we see it through the eyes of Naushika, who's made an effort to study and understand it, we recognize that the Sea of Decay is only deadly because it's fixing the terrible stuff the ancient humans did. It's not something humans can conquer or destroy, it's a force as primeval as nature itself. And it's hubris on the part of humanity to think they can control or destroy the Earth, when instead all they'll do is make it harder and harder for them to live on it. This story is told through the conflict of the characters, but it's present most strongly in the environment they're all navigating. The visual design, the energy, the vibes. The Sea of Decay is a deadly threat, but it's entirely reactive, and Naushika can navigate it relatively safely because she knows how not to antagonize it and to act like a careful, polite guest when she travels through it and takes samples. The visual design and music communicate that as an environment, it's peaceful, calm, and overtly beautiful when it isn't being stirred up into a frenzy through, you guessed it, humans beefing it all over everything. The world tells like- We humans are so good. 90% of the story, the characters just take it over the finish line. But Miyazaki is kind of an unfair outlier to jump to when it comes to the importance and quality of the environmental storytelling. Naushika is a movie about the environment of the world. The main character is basically an ecologist who- Yeah, like this is, this is where we get into the, probably the difficulty of talking about this. 
Um, because the ones were obviously going to be like, it's kind of, because sometimes a lot of it also, the ones we could point to could be so subtle that they're not necessarily like, I don't know. It's, it's a hard one to talk because when we talk about like, especially Miyazaki, it's like, that's hit kind of his thing, you know? Um, and then it's hard to do it with like, to visualize it through, you know, novels as, as I like to use as my examples. Um, so obviously Red can't really pull from novels <laughs> for her for her examples because like, the, the, the visualization is much is always better than you know it, it just helps convey things much better than just saying them. Whose entire goal is studying it. Most stories that put a lot of effort into compelling environmental storytelling are still using it as a backdrop for the more central character drama that takes place in it. And with this in mind, when this concept kind of started taking over my writer brain, I wanted to check an example that was kind of lingering in my head the whole time I was thinking about this. Something very illustrative that I had just not watched from this perspective before. That something being Arcane, a story mm -hmm. very overtly about class struggles and the gulf dividing the idyllic shiny city of Piltover from its own seedy and neglected underbelly of Zaun. Now, Arcane is a show I absolutely love, and I feel like every time I rewatch it, I find a completely new perspective to be impressed by. But this one was pretty simple. I wanted to do something I normally never do, and pay special attention to the backgrounds. And by the time I was six minutes into the first episode, I already had, like, an entire page of notes. The first big shot of Piltover establishes the visual personality of the city extremely efficiently. Clean white walls, uniform blue rooftops, gold trim and highlighting on absolutely everything, got a couple airships for that classy steampunk fantasy flavor. There's even a big astrolabe looking thing in a giant greenhouse to show that this is a city that has big public works that may or may not serve a purpose. The whole city is uniform white and blue, and it's built like the foothills of a mountain, slowly piling up towards the squeaky clean town hall. And just in this first scene, there's things to notice about the way our kid heroes are affecting the world around them. Vi's rooftop parkour bends the gutter she lands on, introducing an imperfection into an otherwise perfect picture. And if that doesn't just sum up the way Piltover sees Zaun and everything from it, it, it does, it does do that. It's clear mm. these environments are not meant for this kind of wear and tear, and since they show no signs of that wear, that tells us pretty efficiently that what these kids are up to is not what generally goes down in this neck of the woods. And then, as a personal treat to me, the very first thing our heroes do at this point is explore an extremely cluttered interior environment looking for things to steal. As we learn an episode later, this is the dorm room slash workshop of Jace, but before we even see or get to know him, the room's layout and arrangement, or lack thereof, tells us that whoever lives here is really singular focused on their work. Even just little touches, like every book on the bookshelf being at a funky angle like they've been taken out and put back in haphazardly, tells us that their owner cares more about what's in the books than about arranging them nicely. Complex machinery is shoved haphazardly under the desk, a full sandwich weighs down a blueprint, and the whole time, the kids rummaging through the room are marveling in near disgust at how much stuff there is. This is a treasure trove beyond anything they've ever seen, and when we see them make their escape, it gradually becomes clear why. The environmental design of the streets is pretty basic. Walls, gutters, some more of that Piltover gold trim and immaculate cleanliness, but as soon as they get across the river, we see things start changing. The gold trim is still there, but the alleyways are narrower and darker. The white paint on the buildings is flaking in places. The streets are still tiled, but now they're puddly, with debris piled up in the corners. Our kid heroes escape down a sewer pipe, and when they emerge back onto street level, the vibes where they are have become completely different. The paint on the walls is spotty and no longer uniformly white. The tile work is uneven. Windows are boarded up. Glass is smashed. The ground is potholed. Everything is just a little bit crooked and uneven and stained. The people maintaining Piltover clearly have a vested interest in keeping it pristine and an abundance of wealth and resources to make sure any repairs are barely noticeable. But downtown, everything has just been patched up to the point of functionality. And when they descend into the lanes under the city, everything is completely different. It's got the verticality of Piltover, but reversed. Instead of building up into a literal shining city on the hill, it's a whole city of narrow alleyways, crowded and smoky with no way for sunlight to find its way in. It's also much more colorful than the clean blue and white over city, with more of a patchwork aesthetic that's disorienting on the streets, but manages to be cozy when applied to the interior of the last drop. Consistently, while it's a mass of sewers and sensory overload, the Undercity is also the only place in the series where we see murals. On paper, it's a very elegant execution of a very simple concept. Piltover is a city of privilege and excess with a veneer of respectability, so everything is clean and gold trimmed and laid out in crisp straight lines. The Undercity is built out of a sewer and a scrap heap, with everything patched together haphazardly out of leftovers and trash. The messiest part of Piltover we see is Jay 
Jace's dorm room, and it's cluttered but not unsanitary. In Zaun, even the air is toxic, which is handily illustrated by how everything is green. And narratively, theme-wise, Piltover's primary method of dealing with things that don't fit its image or its simple worldview is burying them and pretending they don't exist. There's no trash in Piltover because it all goes to Zaun. Every time the Zaunites interact with anything in Piltover, they leave it busted up or dinged or just slightly dirty, not because there's anything wrong with them, but because Piltover's unnatural cleanliness is only maintained by offloading all of their messiness into Zaun and its people. Even the prisons are different. When Jace is briefly in jail, it's got the same Lux aesthetic as the rest of Piltover, while Vi's confinement in Stillwater Prison is much nastier with no effort put into maintaining the aesthetic considerations. And after the episode 3 time skip, we see Piltover has risen to even greater heights with the advent of Hextech, which was supposed to be used to help improve conditions in the Undercity, but has instead just been used to turn Piltover into a global trading hub to reinforce the existing systems of power and wealth with a snazzy new Art Deco aesthetic to match, while the Undercity that's just good fucking storytelling. <laughs> has gotten even worse thanks in large part to Silco running enormous amounts of magic Hulk drug shimmer through its population. In Arcane, the environmental storytelling illustrates very concisely that the crushing systemic inequality that shapes and motivates every character, especially the Undercity kids, is baked in right down to the literal foundations. The perfection of Piltover can't be maintained if it doesn't have anywhere to hide its trash. At every turn, the story signals how much the system of power cares about a given location and its inhabitants by how clean and straight edged it is. At the absolute top of the heap, Mel Medarda and the other council members wear gold trim over gold everything else and talk about how to impress the rest of the world with how perfectly amazing their city is. And at the bottom of the heap is Vi, constantly embroiled in messy bloody fistfights and tangled ruined junkyards, and Jinx, whose entire character aesthetic is chalk art graffiti over cobbled together gadgets, and Victor, whose entire aesthetic is being inconveniently and messily sick around everybody else's nice clean Piltover tech. The environment tells the vast majority of the story. Our heroes are just living in it so yeah <laughs> <laughs> another i know this made sense when i wrote it but goddamn i hope it still makes sense in a week script oh that's me every time i speak <laughs> details are to redeeming for of this it doesn't need to be redeemed it is perfection anyways that was trope talk environmental storytelling this was a good episode i enjoyed it. i like it when red has more of the i i, I enjoy red's more um kind of um obviously tangential sort of uh trope talks um it, this was another one of those trope talk episodes where it feels like red wanted to talk a lot more actually about this trope like this just kind of feels like an abrupt end to it and so like i really want red to one day just have one trope talk where she just continues to yap for a long time but that's just me I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.